Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Beef Randang. That's right, if you had all the most knowledgeable, most well-traveled food writers in the world compile a list of the all-time most delicious foods, there are only a handful of recipes that would make almost all of them. And this incredibly delicious Indonesian curry would be one of them. And if you've had this before, you know exactly why. And if you haven't, you seriously need to watch the rest of this video so you can make some. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by cutting up our beef. And what I have here is a nice big hunk of beef shoulder, or as it's more commonly referred to, beef chuck. And what we want to do is cut this into about two inch pieces. And as usual, the exact size is not as important as getting them nice and uniform. Because if you do, it means they're all going to cook at roughly the same rate. So as we like to say around here, pick a size and stick with it. And by the way, while beef chuck is a fine choice, something even fattier with more connective tissue like a beef short rib or beef shank would also work beautifully. But anyway, regardless of what we use, we'll go ahead and cut that up and set it aside while we move on to what I call the power puree, or as Michelle refers to it, the dry curry slurry. And what that's going to include is some sliced shallots, or I guess some red onion if you can't find those. We'll also toss in some peeled garlic cloves, as well as not one, but two kinds of ginger. All right, we're going to do some peeled and sliced regular ginger root, plus some of this, which is galanga root, which has a thinner skin and lighter color, and a similar flavor to regular ginger, although it's a lot more fragrant and a little more citrusy. And if you can't get that, just the regular ginger will do. And then we're also going to toss in some hot chilies. I'm using some serrano and a red fresno. And then we'll go ahead and season this up with some kosher salt, as well as a whole bunch of dried hot chili flakes. And I'm using Korean because I was out of Indonesian. And then we'll go ahead and finish up with some ground coriander, some turmeric, some cardamom, which not to brag, but I ground myself. And then last but not least, some freshly grated nutmeg. And that's it. Once we have all that in the bowl of our food processor, we'll go ahead and blitz this until it's very finely ground. And I'm not going to show it, but it's a good idea if you stop a couple times and scrape the sides down with a spatula. But anyway, we will blitz that on and off until we have a relatively finely ground mixture that looks a little something like this. And then once that's been accomplished, we will transfer that into a large saute pan, which contains a couple tablespoons of oil. And what we'll do is cook this stirring over medium heat for about seven or eight minutes or until most of the moisture has evaporated. And what we're doing here besides taking the raw edge off the garlic and shallots is also sort of waking up those spices and activating our ginger, not to mention galanga, which is almost as much fun to say as eat. So like I said, we'll go ahead and cook that over medium until that mixture dries out. And it's actually okay if it starts to brown a little bit. And what we'll do once that step's been completed is go ahead and add our beef to the pan. And yes, in case you're wondering, it is unusual we didn't brown the beef first. But according to my sources, not browning the beef is the most authentic way to do it. Plus, as you'll see, this kind of browns at the end of the process. So we'll go ahead and add our beef unbrowned. At which point we will add one can of full fat coconut milk, which is why it looks all separated. Okay, please, under no circumstances, should you use a low fat coconut milk for this. All right, this is called beef rendang, not beef rend diet. So we want that fat and we need that fat. And then if you can find it, we also want to add a little touch of tamarind paste, which is kind of sweet and very sour and very citrusy. And then to help balance things, we'll also add a little bit of brown sugar which should probably be palm sugar, but we don't have that. Which reminds me, I'm gonna give you a few tips in the blog post on what to use if you can't find some of these more exotic ingredients. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that together. And then because this is gonna cook for so long, we'll also wanna add some water, which we will do by filling up and rinsing out our can of coconut milk. And we'll go ahead and stir that in as well. And then what we can do at this point is crank our heat up to medium high because we wanna bring this up to a simmer. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we can go ahead and prep the last ingredients, which would be our lemongrass. And if you can find it, it will look like this. And what we'll do is use about six or seven inches off the bottom end, also known as the bigger, slightly lighter end. And before we add lemongrass to anything, we always want to pound it with the back of a knife to bring out the flavor. Okay, just think of the difference between the flavor of a sliced garlic clove and a crushed garlic clove. Okay, the latter is always going to be way more intensely flavored than the former. And the same thing is in effect here. So we'll go ahead and bruise that with the back of our knife, and then we'll cut that up into a few smaller pieces, and we'll add that to our mixture. And by doing big pieces like this, we'll be able to pull those out later, or at the very least, avoid eating them. 
since lemongrass is extremely tough and fibrous and pretty much inedible. But anyway, we'll go ahead and add our lemongrass and wait for this mixture to start simmering. And then here's the game plan. We're gonna cook this on about medium heat, uncovered for approximately four hours, or until two things happen. All the liquids in the pan reduce completely and coat our beef, as well as our meat gets perfectly fork tender. And once in a while you'll win the rendang lottery, and both those things will happen at the exact same time, but that is extremely rare. So you're gonna to have to be prepared to adjust near the end of the cooking time, depending on which of those two things happens first. And if our sauce happens to reduce all the way before our beef's tender, we will simply add some more water and continue cooking. Or on the other hand, if our beef is tender and we still have too much liquid, we can just crank our heat up to high and reduce it down. And by the way, how often you have to stir this is inversely proportional to how much liquid is in the pan. Meaning the less liquid you have in the pan, the more you have to stir. Okay, so for the first hour or two, you might only have to stir every 15 or 20 minutes. But as our curry sauce reduces and gets thicker, we're gonna wanna stir and toss that beef a lot more often. And yes, this is what they call a dry curry. So for it to be considered authentic, quote unquote, you're not supposed to see any sauce in the pan. But of course, having said that, if you want sauce, have sauce. I mean, you are after all the Vera Wang of your beef rendang. So you are designing this dish. But originally this was a way to preserve meat, which is why it was cooked all the way until the beef was dry. But anyway, to summarize, I cooked mine stirring for approximately four hours until all my sauce had reduced and stuck to the meat and the beef was fork tender. And I went ahead and pulled that off the heat and transferred it into this dish so I could show you exactly how gorgeous it looks, but also so I could mention for best results, we should probably let this cool and then wrap it up and refrigerate it overnight and eat it the next day. And supposedly all the flavors will continue to develop and be even more delicious. But having said that, I was starving. So I went ahead and served some up. And I topped that with a little bit of freshly chopped cilantro. And because this beef is so rich, I do like to serve it with a little bit of fresh lime as well. All right, classically, this is served with a garnish of thinly sliced lime leaves, which I also do not have. And that's it, our beef rendang is beef rend done. And I will admit, visually, this does not look that impressive. I mean, it looks kind of dry and boring, and you're thinking, hey, I need some sauce for this. But a couple bites in and it will all make sense. Because all that sauce didn't go anywhere. Okay, the only thing that evaporated was water vapor. All that goodness is now stuck to the meat, which is just so incredibly and intensely flavored. You really don't want or need a sauce. And while, like I say, things might look a little bit dry, your watering mouth will more than make up for that. And above and beyond the shockingly intense flavors, the only thing that can go wrong texturally is if you don't cook the beef long enough. So please take your time. I mean, if you're going to spend four hours cooking something, don't stop 50 minutes too early. But anyway, that's it. My take on beef rendang. As the old joke goes, sure, there's a lot of ingredients, but at least it takes a long time. But the recipe is actually quite simple. And I have a feeling if one day you make a list of the most delicious things you've ever had, I really believe this will be on it. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.